it is. All right, let's go ahead and get started. My name's Alex. Uh, I'm responsible for the CloudFront business at AWS, so CloudFront's our content delivery network. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to you today about uh, media streaming, uh, and specifically media streaming to multiple devices. Um, what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna go through some of the, basically I'm gonna go through a set of size relatively quickly, and then focus most of our time here together on two different things. One is a demo, where we'll actually take a video and we'll stream it to multiple devices. Uh, the second one is I'm gonna turn things over to Ivan. Ivan's from Vivo, and he'll talk about his experience um, using CloudFront and video streaming in general. In terms of the presentation, um, today I'm gonna start out by going through some of the traditional challenges that are out there when trying to reach multiple devices with your video. Second, I'm gonna go through how you've traditionally solved those problems. Third, I'll then go into some best practices and then how you can use AWS to implement those best practices. Then we'll do the demo and turn things over to Ivan. So, video, why is video hard? Uh, in a nutshell, it's hard because we've got a very fragmented ecosystem out there. There are lots of different devices that have different form factors. There are lots of different co uh, codecs that are out there. There are lots of different protocols. And this has traditionally been very hard for developers to manage. Let's just look at the mobile phone space. Uh, iOS devices, in terms of containers, expect HLS delivery. Android devices vary from vendor to vendor. A Samsung device might expect one format, whereas a Sony device might expect another one. Microsoft Windows, uh, the Windows Phone, they only work with smooth streaming. And there are new devices coming onto the market every day. So how do people traditionally dealt with this? Uh, a lot of people have done multiple transcodes of the same content. Um, they would co encode into different codecs that work on various devices and encode to different form factors, different resolutions uh, that would allow them to reach different screens. And what this, what this leads to is a tremendously um, you know, high combinatorial problem uh, where you have just lots and lots and lots of media assets to manage. That's not great. Uh, security is likewise challenging. Uh, you have to choose between using native players that are built into devices. On some devices, that's your only, ch only choice, versus third-party media players that maybe work in a browser or work on other devices. Uh, DRM can be accomplished, um, or sorry, security can be accomplished either through DRM in certain cases or through tokenized security in other cases or a combination of both. What we think the right way to do it is basically to think of three things. One is to monitor your end user experience. Focus on what's important to the, to the end user. Um, what are they seeing, how are you operating, and what is the impact to your business? Second, from the, that monitoring, identify the, which devices need optimization. Focus on where the big, best delivery networks are. Look at your trends. And then third, uh, look at ways to reduce. Reduce your costs, reduce your turnaround time, uh, and basically reduce the amount of viewers who are having trouble watching your content. So let's go into that and kind of look, look at the traditional way of doing things and then what we think are some better practices. So traditionally, video publishers would run separate stacks. So you would have a stack of, uh, of your infrastructure dedicated to reaching iOS devices. You might have another stack that's dedicated to reaching Android devices, and then a third dev uh, stack dedicated to reaching Windows phones. Except that's really costly. And so what a lot of folks do is they say, I'm not gonna bother. I'm gonna uh, basically cut out availability, say I'm gonna say it's okay not to reach the Windows phone customers uh, in order to reduce my cost and reduce my complexity. So that's a hard trade-off. We think there are some better ways, so let's go into those. Um, there is some commonality developing. Uh, H.264 video um, is really emerging as a standard that will work fairly, um, uh, fairly well across a variety of devices. So here we've got five different platforms, iOS, Android, uh, Windows devices, Roku, PlayStation, and then a desktop, actually six, I'm sorry, I miscounted. Um, all of those can play H.264 video with AAC audio in a uh, MP4 container. Uh, the delivery protocol will differ um, between the Microsoft devices and some of the other ones. But you see that there is some standards emerging. 
Um, so today, the demo will actually go through creating um, H.264 output with AAC audio. Uh, we'll actually package it using HLS. Um, and you can see that that's a standard that's emerging uh, to reach across the various different devices. Second best practice is avoid storage duplication if you can. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of it. Um, there are actually some great storage sessions here at reInvent that I hope you're, um, hope you're looking at. Um, but if you look at what you can do with S3 and Glacier, using S3 as a central storage location and then using Glacier for your arch archival storage, this creates a very good combination of high, 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 very high durability, low cost, and high availability for your, for your centralized storage. I run the content delivery business for AWS CloudFront. Um, we think that picking the right content delivery network is a critical part of getting to that you know, reduction in reduction in cost, reduction in viewers receiving a bad experience, uh, reduction in complexity. Content delivery networks give you a global reach. It lets you optimize for throughput and availability. Um, we'll see today in the demo, you can build some things that uh, add some context awareness into the CDN layer. And then it gives you a great source of access logs that you can mine in order to see who's doing what with your content. Players, players is really more of a decision. There's not a clear winner in my book. Um, some, some devices, as I said, you're only going to have an option to do uh, native players. Uh, third party players, we'll actually see in the demo today, will give you some flexibility, um, particularly on the desktop, um, but let you um, do things like uh, debug better, collect better data, customize a little bit more, um, in some cases lead to a more consistent experience. So the demo today will use a third party player. Uh, securing your asset, again, this is another one where there's not a, a, a pure right answer, um, but really it's more about what's right for you. Um, there's two basic mo three basic models, uh, two in the DRM space and one in a space that we call private content. What DRM does is uniquely encrypt your videos um, and then you hand out keys for the videos for your viewers. So only folks that you hand out a key to uh, are able to watch the, uh, watch the videos. You can do that ahead of time and store the encrypted assets in a place like S3, deliver them through CloudFront. Um, there are other services that let you run a DRM service uh, on the fly. So you're uniquely encrypting videos as they come out the, come out the front door, if you will. And then finally, CDNs like CloudFront uh, offer a private content feature. Sometimes we call this tokenized security. Um, but basically a feature that allows you to sign requests. So say, hey, this request is going to be valid for this period of time. It's going to be valid maybe for this asset or only this asset. Uh, it's going to be valid only for users coming from this IP address. Um, that allows you to control who's suing your content. There's no right answer here. It all depends on your specific use cases. Uh, measurement. Um, it's a little hard to read the black font here, but on the right, uh, you'll see a graph called real user measurement. Um, at CloudFront, we've been very big uh, recently on looking at user experience from the viewer end. We started out at CloudFront um, very, with very tight instrumentation around our servers. Uh, we then supplemented that later on with some what we call synthetic measurements, things, uh, tests that were probing the CDN from outside our network, uh, looking in. Um, but the last couple years, we've been really focusing on instrumenting actual end user clients video players, websites, uh, and getting that data back in that shows end user experience from the viewer's perspective. Your end users don't live in data centers. They're not watching you know, videos from an EC2 instance in most cases. So monitoring from an EC2 instance, while it will give you a one view of your availability, will give you an incomplete view. So a lot of the modern, um, both sort of web frameworks and player technologies allow you to instrument your end user clients to get statistics like what's the average bit rate that I'm achieving getting video down to my customer? How long is it taking for my video streams to start from the end user's perspective? How often are my videos stuttering or stopping playing? Again, from the end user perspective. These are things that are virtually impossible to do if you're only looking from the client's, uh, sorry, from the server side. So let's go into AWS. I think I've you know, touched on a lot of these along, along the way. Um, 
At the highest level, we have a very well-formed ecosystem to address media use cases. There are a lot of things that you can do natively in AWS. Um, example of that we'll look at today is the Elastic Transcoder product that uh, will allow um, you to uh, convert videos from various different formats to one another. Um, but obviously, S3, EC2, CloudFront, these are services that can be used natively um, to help media use cases. Uh, if that's not enough, if you will, there's a lot of other choice out there in the AWS marketplace. Um, so I'd encourage you all to check out the media solutions that are available there from our AWS partners. Um, AWS's uh, sort of core model is very well attuned for what media customers need. Uh, it gives you a way to cost effectively scale and only pay for the resources that you actually use. And then we've added some media specific capabilities to the uh, platform. Andy mentioned his keynote yesterday, one of the certifications that we went out and, and got largely from feedback from folks like you is MPAA certification. So we, we, we follow their security best practices. We'll see today one of the ways that you can encode, which we talked about one of the best practices being encoding to a uh, take advantage of device commonality. Uh, today what we'll do is we'll look at a demo that uses Elastic Transcoder to co encode into HL, uh, H.264, AAC audio uh, with an HLS uh, fragmentation scheme. Um, talked a little bit about this again, sort of the combination of using S3, Glacier. This talks a little bit about the storage gateway to get data in and out of the AWS cloud is a real good way to manage your assets. Video streaming through CloudFront. Um, one of the features we'll look at today in CloudFront, so CloudFront's a global CDN. We have 46 edge locations on five continents that will cache local copies of your media asset so that your users are reaching a local server rather than a distant one. Um, we'll look at a feature today called cache behaviors that allow you to basically branch as this diagram shows your end users to different origins uh, based on the type of content they're, they're requesting. So specifically what we'll do today is we'll look at using a CloudFront cache behavior in order to send devices that support HLS to an HLS-based uh, origin and then have other things fall back onto a uh, progressive download. I think I mentioned all of these points. Um, the one last one I'll, I'll call out here is uh, customer access logs. Um, this is a great way to get insight from uh, the server side, at least, into what your customers are doing. So we'll turn that on uh, along the way. Uh, finally, the, uh, I mentioned this as well. Uh, CloudFront offers a fairly rich set of private content um, policies. These are signed URLs. So what you do is you create a policy that says, these are the circumstances under which I want my video to play. Uh, here's the name of the file, here's the time I want it to be playable for the next two hours or the next 10 minutes, whatever is appropriate for you. Um, here's the IP range perhaps that I want to limit it to, so I'm only going to let the uh, customer that I, I trust um, play the video. Uh, you do that all on your web server, you sign that policy file, create a signature using a private key. We as CloudFront have the public key pair, we decrypt the signature and if the signature is valid and the policy says it's okay, we serve the request. If we don't, we don't. And then the other place uh, we, we will look at, actually I don't know if we'll do this today, but I'd be happy to talk to you guys about this afterwards. Um, there's a great opportunity to use Elastic MapReduce in order to process log files generated by Amazon CloudFront. In fact, one of the first sample apps that we launched when we launched CloudFront was a uh, log as analysis pack package for CloudFront access logs. So I think with that, let me switch over to the demo. And I'm going to do a couple of things. I've got a kind of cheat sheet that I'm going to follow along. Um, but I'm going to start with an actually fairly simple MP4 file. Let me close this. Um, what I've got here uh, is a launch. Um, it's actually a launch from, from NASA of the Mars lander. Um, so this is a, a, a video here. It's an HD video that NASA puts out. Um, if you're not a fan of Big Buck Bunny, um, which I think a lot of us in the business have seen quite a few times, the nice thing about NASA videos is they're all DRM-free. 
So what I've done is I've taken this video, I've put it in S3, uh, sorry, they're uh, uh, royalty free, they're public domain, so you've paid for them with your, with your tax dollars. Uh, so th thank you, NASA. Um, what I've done here is I've just put this into a, 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 a Amazon S3 bucket. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna prepare this uh, for delivery and I'm gonna use Amazon Elastic Transcoder in order to create HLS output. Um, so what HLS output is, is it's a series of video fragments um, that operate um, using an MP4, uh, uh, sorry, MP4 input, HLS output. We're gonna have three different bit rates. HLS will then manage the uh, adaptive streaming capabilities, so it will match the bit rate to the bandwidth that's available for the customer. So if you're on a high speed internet, you're gonna get the HD version. If you're um, you know, on, a, on a mobile phone, uh, you're gonna get a low, low resolution version. Um, so let me, let's see how to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to the AWS management console and I'm gonna select the Elastic Transcoder service. And I've got one here, I'll actually remove the pipeline so we can um, see one from scratch. I'm gonna start by creating a pipeline. A pipeline connects an input bucket to an output bucket. That's what it does. It's a way of saying this is where my source material is and this is where I want you to put the transcoded files. Um, so I'm gonna create a new one and um, what I'm gonna say, I'll call it you know, Alex reInvent. And uh, for my input bucket, I'm gonna choose that bucket that I have my video in, so CF reInvent 2013. And then for my output bucket, um, I'll choose Alex Demo Out. It asks me what kind of storage I want to use. You can use standard or reduce redund redundancy. I'll use standard storage here. Um, and it, similarly, you can choose a location if you want to create thumbnails. So I will choose Alex Demo Thumbnail Out. And again, choose standard. Um, what I want to do is make sure that files as they are written are public. Um, that's good for a demo like this. It may not be right for your use case. Um, so this, uh, the pipeline feature allows you to say what kind of uh, access do I want to grant uh, to uh, users. Uh, here what I'm going to do is just choose an Amazon S3 group. I'm going to choose all users and say give them rights to openly download um, the file. And I'm going to do the same thing for my thumbnails. So I'll do, again, S3 group all users open download. If you have the latest copy of, you know, the new, um, i trying to think of a new movie, a Star Trek movie or something like that, you probably don't want to put it open, but uh, for a purpose of a demo, this works great. So now I've created a, a pipeline. So the pipeline connects my input bucket to the output bucket. So I now need to fill that pipe, pipeline with some, with some jobs. So let me go ahead and create a new encoding job. So I'm gonna select my Alex reInvent job. Um, and it's gonna give me the list of videos that are available, a list of files that are available in that bucket. So I'm gonna say, it, um, in my input bucket. So I'm gonna choose the MP4 file. Um, what I'm gonna wanna do is prefix um, all my outputs into kind of a, a you know, S3 pseudo directory. So uh, everything that I, uh, I'm gonna produce, I'm gonna put it into the NASA slash MSL slash launch folder. Um, I'm then gonna choose a preset. Um, there are, if you're a real encoding guru, um, you can actually create your own presets. I'm not, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose from a set that are available in the ETS sort of standard product. So here what I'm trying to do is do HLS. So I'm gonna I'll start with the low res. I'll choose a system preset for HLS output at 400K. Um, I'm gonna pre uh, set the segment duration. Let me do that first. Uh, HLS lets you set different, uh, whatever duration of the segments that you want. Uh, this is in seconds, so here what I'm gonna set is a 10 second segment. So each of my fragments that I'm gonna produce are gonna be 10 seconds long. And then I need to give, it a, uh, give each of my output a key. Um, a key will help the uh, manifest file that HES will create for me know which of the different versions it, it's looking for. So basically anything in my 400K output I'm gonna prefix with the key HLS underscore 400K. Um, there's some other features. We talked a little bit about thumbnails. I'm actually gonna skip that. You can rotate stuff or add a watermark. Um, 
This is one output, but I don't want to do just one. Remember, I talked about adaptive bitrate technology. So this is a pretty low resolution video at 400K. Let's go ahead and add a couple more. So I'm going to add a HLS preset for one megabit. And there I will um, transcode into one megabit. And again, I'll use 10 seconds as my output. Let's make sure I did that right. I did. And then I'll do a third for two megabits. And again, I'm setting the duration to be 10 seconds, and then the output key, a unique name, in this case, two megabits. So this is telling ETS how it wants to produce these outputs. And if I stop there, what it's going to do is just produce a whole bunch of video fragments, um, which is useful, but not what a player is going to expect. So what I also want to do is tell ETS in, to create for me a playlist. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, add a playlist. I'm going to create a master playlist. It's an HLS v3 playlist. And then I'm going to tell it which of these outputs to include. So I want it to include the 400K. I want it to include the 1 meg. And I want it to include the 2 meg. So just let's make sure I've got everything set. So I've got three outputs, a master playlist, and then included in that master playlist um, are, three, uh, are my three outputs. I create my job. Now this will take a few minutes. Um, it's, it's usually pretty quick, but for the purpose of the demo, uh, rather than having us, you can you know, check that my job is submitted, and then I can refresh and see that it's progressing. Actually runs pretty quick, but what I've done is I've actually created one of these already with the same settings uh, so we can see the output without having to wait. So if I go back to the Amazon S3 con uh, console, uh, I see the output bucket that I specified here. Or that's actually a different output bucket, but has the same, same settings. of a live demo. Well, what you will see here when it loads is you'll see a folder that I created, which is the, the, um, the pseudo folder uh, NASA underscore MSL underscore launch. Uh, in that, you'll see a collection of video fragments. Uh, the video fragments um, are connected using individual manifest files. Um, so there's a manifest file for the 400K encode. There's a different manifest file for the uh, um, one meg encode. And there's a different manifest file for the uh, two meg encode. And then finally, you'll see a master um, manifest or playlist file that uh, weaves the three together. Um, so I'm not really sure why this isn't working. Um, I don't know if I've lost my internet connection here. We'll do a refresh and try again one last time. And if not, we'll move on. OK, there we go. So there's the folder I was mentioning. And you see here, uh, here's a manifest file for all the 1 meg outputs. You see a series of sequential outputs here. Each of these outputs are going to be um, 10 seconds long. Um, you see another set for the 2 meg. Notice these are you know, roughly twice as big because it's uh, uh, twice the encoding. And then at the bottom here, you see the 400K. Uh, scroll down to the very bottom, you'll see the, the master playlist. Uh, the master playlist, if we were to uh, look at it, um, what it is is it creates a reference to the, to the different playlists that I just created. Uh, it's kind of hard to read here, um, but you can see the, uh, here's the um, 400K uh, encode, and then there's a similar one for the uh, 1 meg and the 2 meg. So with that, I've now created a distribution, uh, sorry, I've now created an S3 bucket that, can, that contains all the content that I want. Um, so now what I want to do is create a Amazon CloudFront distribution uh, that will d deliver all of this. So let's go back to the console. Um, 
and I'm going to this time go to the CloudFront console. So I'll click there and go to CloudFront. And I'm going to create a new distribution. And it's a web distribution. Um, this is the distribution class that we use to deliver content over HTTP. Uh, as my origin domain name, I'm going to select the, um, oh, here I'll select the, the bucket that, I guess I can select the other one, um, that contains my videos. Um, I'm going to actually leave most of the settings here uh, as, uh, as the default. Uh, the one thing I, I will change is I'll go ahead and use logging here. And uh, I can log to a, a bucket here. This was one of the features I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, will allow you to see details about your traffic. Um, but other than that, I'm going to start by just creating a basic distribution with the kind of stock settings. I'm going to hit Create. And then what I'm going to do is you see this one is, while it's enabling, I can actually go in and I'm going to edit it. And I'm going to add a second origin. Um, with the second origin, I'm going to add, I actually did it backwards, but it doesn't matter. Um, the second origin I'm going to add is the, um, is the encoded version, so the one that contains my HLS fragments. And so I'll say create here. And so now I have two different, two different origins. I have one that is the HLS version and one that was my input bucket. Um, so I'll, I'll use the HLS version for my HLS traffic and I'll use my original one uh, to fall back to for devices that don't support HLS. Uh, how am I going to tell CloudFront what to do with which? Uh, for this, I'm going to use a feature called cache behaviors. What cache behaviors are is a set of rules that say, if you see a path like this, treat the uh, cache like that. And there's lots of different things you can change. Um, the thing I'm going to change is the origin. Um, so I'm going to say, if you see something that starts with web star, web slash star, so anything that uh, is web slash star, I want you to use the uh, distribution that, is, that contains my original file. Um, you can see there's other things I can, I can do. I can tell it to support other verbs, which is a new feature we added, and tell it how to deal with cookies or query strings. Um, but again, here I'm just telling it to use a different origin. Um, and then otherwise, um, and otherwise, what I want you to do is use the other origin, use the HLS one. And so I'll edit that. Um, so now I, if, if something uh, starts with web star, I'm going to use my input origin, which is where my original version of my file was. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to use the output origin where my HT, uh, HLS files are. So now that's all set, again, uh, because it will take, it takes about 15 minutes for CloudFront distributions to go in sync. Uh, what's happening there is we're going out to the network of edge locations and we're basically propagating these se uh, sessions. So if uh, a CloudFront server gets a request for one of these objects, uh, it will know how to deal with them. And it takes about 15 minutes for us to get that information out to our network of locations all around the world. Uh, not wanting to wait 15 minutes, um, I again created uh, one ahead of time. And so it's the one that says D236. So if I go back to my distributions, I find one that says D236. I can look at my distribution settings. Um, and you'll see exactly the same setup, that if it's a, on a web, it's going to go to this, this origin. If it's on anything else, it's going to go to the file where I have, um, sorry, the bucket where I have my encoded outputs. Um, so now I'm almost done. Um, what I've done uh, next is, uh, actually, so now you can see, use, use that CloudFront distribution that we created uh, to either get the playlist. Um, so we can do that here. Um, and you'll see that this is the same playlist that we looked at from S3. Now it's coming through CloudFront. Um, or you can even get, it, get the actual video. So here uh, I'm going to go to the dash web directory. And because of that, the cache behavior will send me back to the S3 bucket. And so here I'm just doing a progressive download. Um, what I've done from there is I've configured a player. Um, I'm using the JW player. Um, which is one of the third-party products that are out there. Um, it's, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to uh, do a couple things. Um, for the web, for browsers, um, it's going to play 
used a, a Flash framework to play HLS content via the browser. Um, for uh, that's the main thing it's it's going to do, but it will also manage some of the fallback logic uh, for devices that don't support HLS, so that they'll fall back on um, on uh, on progressive download. So here uh, we can look at the full web page. Uh, what I'll do is I'll turn on the developer console, and so I'll hit play. Oops, covered it up. And so what you can see is that it's making a series of um, requests. Uh, here we seem to be getting the two meg stream, which is pretty cool. Um, and so it, it requested segment one, and then now it's requesting segment two. Every 10 seconds, it will go and grab the HLS content. Um, if, I don't know if we got this to work, but I'll give it, actually, I don't think we did. Um, so I'll skip it. If you're on your, your mobile phone, um, you can uh, go to bit.ly slash cfreinvent2013 and play the video from your device. If you use an iPhone, we were going to show this. We had some technical difficulties, but you can play the, uh, uh, the content natively through um, HLS on an iPhone, um, but it will fall back to progressive download on a device like a Windows phone that doesn't support HLS. So what I've done there, again, I've started with an asset in Amazon S3. I've used Amazon ETS to encode it into HLS, and then I've used a third-party player, JW Player, in order to manage the fallback logic uh, so that A, uh, HLS plays in the browser, and B, um, devices that don't support HLS will still get the progressive video. So the demo has accomplished my goal, which was to stream video to a variety of different platforms. It's fairly simple, um, but it, it works. So with that, I'm going to talk, uh, pass things over to Ivan. Ivan's going to take you through a much more complicated uh, real-world situation, uh, which is what he does at Vivo. Hi guys, my name is uh, Ivan Yang. I'm the Director of Systems Engineering at Vivo and I'm responsible for uh, infrastructure, architecture, uh, video encoding and content delivery and uh, things of that nature. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Vivo in case you're not familiar with the platform. Uh, what we are is an all premium music uh, video entertainment site. And just to give you some context about uh, the type of numbers we're talking about, uh, in August 2013, we did about 4.4 billion video views worldwide. And, you know, we're really starting to see this trend now where a lot of this viewership is moving to mobile devices. And uh, of that, 28% of global streams were viewed on mobile. And we have 250 million uh, unique visitors and a catalog of uh, over 75,000 videos from 21,000 different artists. And that number is actually approaching closer to 100,000 videos now. But some of the things that uh, I wanted to discuss with you guys is you know, the, the, cha the challenges that we're, we're facing in uh, the video delivery space. So you know, one of the biggest things that we have to deal with is to provide the same cohesive experience across all these different platforms and disparate amount of protocols. And really, we have to enable ourselves to, to quickly adapt and, and find ways to seize these new opportunities as new devices arise, new platforms arise. You want to be able to have your content out uh, on those devices and platforms. And uh, here are some of the, the platforms that Vivo supports currently. So on the web, we're doing uh, dynamic streaming over RTMP. Uh, we're also on iOS devices, Apple TV, Samsung TV, Roku, and that's all using HLS delivery. Um, we also just recently, uh, about a week and a half ago, pushed out a Flash syndicated player that is now also playing HLS over the web for our syndication partners. And we also do smooth streaming on platforms, Windows platforms and Xbox as well. And um, on Android, we do progressive media downloads as well as on the mobile web. And we also have a 24-hour live linear uh, video channel, and that is actually 
transcoded and repackaged on the fly in uh, all three different uh, protocols, RTMP, HLS, and Smooth. So at current, we have about 35 different uh, video renditions for each of our video assets. So if you think about it, you know, close to 100,000 assets, that's about over 3 million objects. So there's a, there's a lot of video content that needs to be managed there. And at current, all of our, our video streaming uh, is done with uh, adaptive bit rates, except on Android and mobile. So what we're really trying to work towards, you know, at least from the engineering perspective, is how can we consolidate the amount of renditions that we have to pump out for each video? And um, the way that we're working towards approaching that is through adaptive bit rates like HLS and smooth streaming and using those protocols to deliver video content on multiple devices. So it's really about reusing the same video output as, as many times as possible. And our, our approach with HLS is really to find the least common denominator. What you want to do is have a set of, of video encoding properties that is going to work on as many devices as possible. But then you face the challenge, really, of the different implementations of HLS itself. Some devices for HLS 3 spec or the, dr the draft version of the spec versus HLS 4 draft version of the spec. Players behave different, differently on different devices, even though they claim to support HLS. So really, the, the way that we try to tackle the problem is get the video settings and the encoding settings genericized enough where you know, they can work on many places as possible, but then let's find the lightweight options that we can do to manipulate to make it work across all platforms. And um, part of that approach is dealing with the HLS manifests themselves. So you know, uh, Alex showed you before the, the sample HLS manifest that he generated through the elastic transcoder. And you know, one of the things that you have to measure with our, you know, it's a trade-off really is, do you want to start at a higher bit rate, a higher quality, versus a slower startup time, or not? And there's different scenarios and different use cases for different devices, obviously. But the goal is still to use the same video encoding settings. But the trick is really, we can make many different manifests adapt to different types of devices, a mobile device, uh, a large screen connected device. So you know, it's OK to have a 500 kilobit starting bit rate on a 3G or cellular connection. But you know, for, for a living room experience, you really want to start at a much higher bit rate because you're talking large screens, 50, 60 inch LCDs, and things of that nature. So um, it might be a little bit difficult to, to read, but here's an example of a master variant playlist that, that we output. And um, you'll see some of the, the tags that here that we specify. This specific playlist um, is for the HLS4 spec. Uh, we do things like specifying the codecs and the bandwidth levels uh, that you're going to target for your distribution. And um, you know some of the technical details like AVC1, it really uh, talks about what the profile of the H.264 encoding is and what the level means. So all those. Um, Different combinations there mean different things in terms of uh, the, the profile level, like you know, main or baseline, 3.1, 4.1, so on and so forth. And here's an example of the child playlist. And in this case, it's an iframe playlist. So this is something that we did uh, especially to support devices that can do things like trick play. And what this, this type of playlist does is you specify a byte range for that, that segment or chunk. And you know, it, it, it's really describing the properties of the iframes on, on that particular segment. So you know, we specify the duration of, of the segments to be 10 seconds. And then we basically are telling the client, this is how you play the iframe. And that's why you can seek or scrub through videos and still see actual frames moving without the player having to decode extra information. And this is kind of an example of devices being somewhat fragmented because not all devices support this type of behavior. So, you know, these manifests, they're only like, they're really small, like a kilobyte. So we can create tons of these. I mean, we have manifests with low starting bit rates, higher bit rates for large devices, and it's just creating extra one kilobyte text files, really. So it doesn't harm anything in terms of, you know, how long the whole process takes. So a little bit about you know, video streaming and our strategy. 
Um, you know, if you're to be starting from scratch today, you definitely want to go with uh, HTTP-based protocol. Um, it's pretty much ubiquitous. Um, it's cheaper. Um, you know, FMS servers typically have a higher cost associated with them due to licensing and operational costs and things of that nature. And uh, as we discussed, you know, ABR protocols are the way to go. Um, you want to be able to adapt to users with varying bandwidth conditions rather than just here's a progressive media download, you know, wait until however long it takes to download to your client. And, you know, studies have shown that, hey, we're all impatient. Like, you know, if the video doesn't start within a couple seconds, you're out of there, right? So that, that costs you in real dollars and cents, you know, from monetization strategy. And with the CDN approach, um, you know, Vivo is a multi-CDN shop, so, you know, we utilize different CDNs. And it's not for everybody, but there are definitely benefits to it. You know, you have the option of falling back to a different provider. If there's an outage on one provider, if there's a, you know, MLS soccer or some large pr Premier Cup type thing going on, and a particular user with a particular ASN is having better performance on a different provider, you have the ability to switch between those on the fly. And that brings value, but it's also, you kind of have to weigh the costs involved in it, both monetarily and for operational overhead. A little bit about our encoding workflows. Um, the encoding system at Vivo is a, is a queue-based system. So what we do is um, we have queues that handle specific types of jobs. Um, the four main types of jobs are the encoding request, the encoding job itself, the delivery process, and updating the actual data layer. And here's a diagram of that system. So what happens here is, you know, when we ingest the video, a request gets created to upload the video from our physical data center into the cloud, into something like S3. And then once that process happens, that message gets destroyed from that queue. A new one gets established in the encoding queue. Actually, multiple ones do for each of the specific platforms that we're trying to encode for. And we, we can scale up both vertically and horizontally and have many nodes attack the messages in the queue. So it, it's a really great system in, in, in that regard because you know, sometimes you have to do a bulk catalog ingest or you, know, you sign up a new partner and you need to get you know, 10,000 new assets into the system right away. And this really gives us the flexibility to react very quickly to new opportunities. Um, we recently had to re-encode our entire catalog, and we did it in about three days. So, you know, having that scalability both horizontally and vertically is very important. After those uh, encoding processes finish, the videos get outputted into S3, and then we have delivery jobs to upload the files to each of our CDN partners using various protocols, FTP, Aspera, um, you know, uh, uh, REST API calls to those various partners, and we dump the data there. And then finally, what we do is we update our database with those playout links. So what we ha have here is a sample um, JSON message that shows all the contents of, of this message that the encoder picks up. So we have things like the service stack, right? M my encode, like my service can act in, in one of many different ways. I can act as an encoder. I can act as a delivery guy. I can act as a guy that updates the database. I can act as a guy that uploads the files to the CDNs. So the message is really saying, hey, which role am I assuming right now? And then we do things like, you know, define where the source file is, define where to output the file. Um, we have some stuff in there about closed captioning, which, you know, FCC requirements coming later on in the future that we'll have to be concerned with. But that's the basic anatomy of the messages there. And once again, you know, some of the benefits of this type of system is it's stateless. If a message fails at any time, or you know, we use spot instances a lot as well, if that instance gets yanked and the video wasn't done encoding, the message just goes back to a queue and somebody else picks it up. So you don't really have to worry about something failing unless it's persistent. Uh, once again, scalable, both vertically and horizontally. And the most important thing is that it's maintainable. You can depend on this workflow in a very repeatable type of fashion. You can extend it, like, I need to add another step. I suddenly want to make thumbnails of all of my videos. I suddenly want to include closed captioning. It's just another step in the process. So 
a little bit about the, the video encoding settings themselves. Um, we provide multiple bit rates for the devices to choose from, and we stick with H.264 and uh, AAC audio just because it's so widely supported. Um, even within H.264, though, you have to look at different things like the profile that you're using, the level that you're using, baseline profiles. There's less complexity, but poor compression. Higher profiles, you know, you get better compression and playback, but less amount of support on, on older devices. And lastly, live streaming, completely different beast. You really have to have constant bit rate, constant frame rate for everything. So recently in August, we launched on a new platform, Apple TV. And part of the problem was we were already doing HLS encoding at the time, but how do we take the HLS encodes that we had and expand them out so that we can reuse them on larger devices, Apple TV, including things like Samsung TV, um, so we can take those same HLS playback uh, and use the same videos and just play them everywhere, whether it's a tiny mobile device that has a four-inch screen or a 50-inch television. So some of the things we did were, you know, previously we were only encoding up to 2,400 kilobits. Then we added a 34 and a 4,200 kilobit at 1080p also, so the larger devices can have that clear playback. And we implemented the playlist scrubbing features just by adding alternate manifests that those devices that are capable of taking advantage of that can use. Start at a higher bit rate, because I know I'm a TV, and I know I'm on a connected wired internet connection, so I'm not gonna have problems with 3G or cellular. And you know, it was a big undertaking, but with the type of encoding framework that we had that I described earlier, we are really able just to scale everything out and get it done uh, within a few days. And here's a diagram discussing uh, our API stack. And this is ultimately what the clients call to get the playback for um, the videos for client-side rendering. So uh, we're, we're a hybrid environment. We have a physical data center, and we also use multiple cloud providers as well. So you know, our master SQL database resides in a physical data center. What we do is we replicate them to our cloud providers. So we have those replication nodes um, and you know we have multiple nodes in multiple availability zones, and we have cache preloaders and utilize Elastic Cache, which is very simple to use, and Beanstalk um, to scale the web heads for the API. So you know a big premiere comes out, I'm able to ramp up 50, 60, 70 extra servers to handle the load, and then spin them right back down. And just a summary of the workflow. So we ingest the videos from our partners, we get the me mezzanine files. A request gets sent to our encoding system. It goes through those four steps of the process, and then the playout links are written to the database so the API can access them and serve them out. So then you have the client side, they make API calls, they get the playback links, and we stream them from all different CDNs. We set different policies saying, hey, I want to stream this from CloudFront, I want to stream this from so-and-so. So some of our experience with CloudFront and, and why it worked out well for us is the ease of integration. You know, we have our encoding workflows living in multiple cloud providers, and it's just very simple for us to extend the logic to say, hey, after I'm done encoding, I'm just going to dump it to S3. And then as Alex showed you earlier, it's so simple to just turn the S3 bucket into a distribution, and you can start video streaming right away. And the pricing is competitive, and you know, with the pay-as-you-go model, it's so simple to just Run an experiment, do a proof of concept, see, hey, is this gonna work? So you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to figure out if your proof of concept is gonna be viable. And another nice thing is you know, the ability to just pre-warm the cache. So we can spin up EC2 instances um, in all the different locations around the world that they offer and pre-warm cache for popular content that we know is gonna hit. You know, like the Miley Cyrus video, it did 19.8 million views in, in 24 hours. And, Something like that, we know it's going to happen. So you know, we can easily warm that stuff in cache so it's served out very efficiently. And uh, with the S3 model, it's, it's a pretty compelling use case and pretty compelling story for cost savings, really. Uh, you have the option to um, use the reduced redundancy storage, um, which is uh, very competitively priced. And for us, since we do short form content, uh, that's what we do, we use uh, reduced redundancy because if I lose a video asset that's encoded, I don't really care, I can re-encode it within like three minutes and have it replaced. 
So it's a, it's a pretty nice model there for us. Some of the other things, it's very simple to set up security with the origin access identity. Um, you know, you can ensure that, that folks have to access it through the CDN, um, you know, that ultimately pulls the, the data from S3. Um, you know, it's, you can integrate your own tokenization schemas if you want to take it a step further. You know, you can have token auth on your API, but you can even go further and tokenize the actual playback links themselves. So there's several different options there. And with the recent ability to add SSL, you can take that route um, if you need it with your own domain name. It's also very important to analyze your logs. So you really have to go through this exercise to see where most of your, your streaming is coming from, uh, what edge locations are the best places to choose. Because, I mean, everybody wants in-country delivery. I have customers in Australia. I want to stream from Australia. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense fiscal, uh, fiscally. You know, the uh, APAC region is very expensive to stream from. Um, some places in South America are expensive to stream from. And we even did some exercises before where in-country delivery in South America was actually slower than delivering that content from, like, Miami. And, you know, you really have to analyze your logs and figure out what's the right balance, right? If you can get cheap in-country delivery, great. If not, it may be better to serve the content from elsewhere. And ultimately, what we were able to do with this new HLS implementation, CloudFront, the new video encoding settings we discussed is we're able to raise the average bit rate and quality that our users uh, were experiencing with their, with their playback. So after these changes on HLS, on iOS, we, we saw an average increase from about 1,700 kilobits to uh, around 2,200 kilobits per second. So there, there, there was a notable change in quality there, which ultimately that's what you want for your customers. And some of the larger overall concerns, there still is the lack of standardization in the industry. Fragmentation is still a major problem, but it's not going to go away anytime soon. You know, there's stuff like Dash, HTML5, a lot of hype around it, but we just don't know yet whether that's going to be the, the magic bullet that you know, makes a lot of these problems go away. So I really want to stress it's important to you know, take the initiative and have these discussions internally, set your own standards, and be proactive about how you're going to approach these problems. You know, we decide internally we're going adaptive, HTTP, HLS, smooth, and, and you know, that's where we decide to do most of our, our video delivery with. And ultimately, it's very important to pick the right CDN because you know, we've seen repeatedly customers want their content and they want it right away. So it's very important to make sure that startup time is low and um, you, know, you have good video playback right off the bat. Thank you.